Thanks for listening to the Thyroid Fixer podcast with your host, me, Dr. Amy Horneman, aka the Thyroid Fixer. Also, functional medicine practitioner, hormone and weight loss expert. We're talking all things thyroid, hormone, and health related in order to empower, educate, and transform you. Remember, I fix your thyroid, I fix your hormones, I fix your life. So let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. So today we are going to be talking about PCOS, how it connects to hypothyroidism and all of the shared symptoms with both conditions. So this is going to be a game changer for you. And you can probably hear the excitement in my voice. The latest introduction, the latest member of the family to the fixer line is metabolism fixer. And this, oh my God, I formulated this just for all my people out there that need to lose weight, that need help in the weight loss department, that can't lose weight no matter what they do, that feel like they have a slow metabolism. And it might be thinking of trying all those peptides out there. You know, the Beverly Hills soccer mom drug of choice for weight loss peptides. Or even if you're on them already and you're like, man, these are really expensive and I'm still not losing weight. Add in metabolism fixer. Here's what I did. I took the power of T2, which increases your basal metabolic rate while you are sitting there watching Netflix. You're burning fat while you're watching Netflix. I combined it with a very unique patented ingredient called Suppressa. Suppressa has multiple clinical trials backing its efficacy in reducing your appetite, decreasing snacking, and providing way more control over your food intake. It is amazing. We also see improved emotional well-being, just decreased food cravings all around, reduced hunger, and weight management. Add on top of that, we have green tea extract, we have purple forest purple tea extract, both of which affect the metabolism in a very positive way without the jitters of normal fat burning supplements out there from the 1980s and 90s, right? The ones that made you feel like you're having a heart attack. You will not have that in any of my supplements, thyroid fixer or metabolism fixer. But metabolism fixer, ooh, yeah, we kicked it up a notch. It is in powder form, so you can drink it through your day. It's gonna flavor your water. We got orange crush and refreshing citrus. I love them both. It is going to keep you under control all day long. So you throw a couple scoops in your water bottle in the morning, throw a scoop or two in your water bottle throughout the day. You will have fat burning and appetite control the entire day for what? An eighth of a price of the peptides? Oh my God, you can't go wrong. So grab some metabolism fixer today. Please let me know how you do on it. I am super excited for you. Super excited. So before I do that, let me tell you about a freebie that I have. I designed, there we go, a nice little kitchen guide for you. So it's for you to spring clean everything, spring clean your body, do some swap outs with what's in your pantry, in your fridge, in your supplement cabinet. And I provided a nice little shopping list. So you can just start to make these little changes. And for those of you who know me, I'm very straightforward. I'm very blunt. So I will obviously tell you what you should and shouldn't be doing. So I'm calling out my vegans out there. We kind of go down and dirty as to why you might still be struggling with weight and hair thinning and breaking off and your skin and all that good stuff. But that's okay. I also provide a keto vegan plan for you so you can lower your carbohydrates, not load up on all the soy-based garbage that are in so many vegan and vegetarian menus, and you can clean up your diet as well. So there's something for everyone. You can go, you can download that. I wanted to throw that out there before we started talking about PCOS. So for those of you who don't know, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and feel free to give a shout out if you are one of the sufferers of PCOS, and if you are like me, a dual sufferer of PCOS and hypothyroidism. I always talk, I talk a lot about insulin resistance, which is one of the key components of PCOS. 
And we'll get into that in a moment. But I always say having insulin resistance and hypothyroidism is like a double metabolic whammy. It just puts you at such a disadvantage when it comes to losing weight. It really puts you at a great advantage to gain weight if you look sideways at a brownie. But having these two really um, is not fun if any of you have both of them. But we're going to dive in today as to why they do intersect and interconnect on so many different levels. So we're talking about weight. We're talking about infertility. So I've worked with many, many women to help them get pregnant because even women that go to fertility specialists, oftentimes the main thing that is causing the infertility is undiagnosed hypothyroidism, subclinical hypothyroidism, where the woman is told she's normal, and the coexistence of insulin resistance and possibly PCOS that just was overlooked. Or the poor woman is treated with birth control, which is the main treatment for PCOS, and doesn't really, and she's trying to get pregnant, so birth control isn't really going to do anything. But they say, hey, let's put you on birth control for a few months, balance out your hormones, get your cycle regular again. Then you can go try to get pregnant. And that's not solving the root cause of the situation. That's the beauty of functional medicine. We get to the root cause of the problem. So I say oftentimes, I joke half-heartedly, that I've gotten many women pregnant because I have helped them to get pregnant by getting to the root cause, treating the subclinical hypothyroidism and actually treating PCOS how it should be treated. Oftentimes with PCOS, PCOS, we see an increase in goiter. So we're going to see hypothyroidism and PCOS intersect. We know that the thyroid is the master gland. So we have the thyroid at the top. It has a trickle down effect to all hormones. So it's going to affect your insulin. That's why we talk about insulin resistance so often coinciding with hypothyroidism. And then we have to talk about the sex hormones, progesterone, estrogen, testosterone. Don't forget, ladies, you have testosterone too. And it's very, very important. And we want it in the proper amounts. But with PCOS, that's where we see an increase in testosterone and mainly dihydrotestosterone or the androgens that go along with high testosterone. What we will see to diagnose, so PCOS is diagnosed with, you have to have three of these conditions, we'll say. Number one is high androgens. Number two is increased insulin. Number three is irregular periods or missing periods completely. And then number four are the cysts on the ovaries, tiny, tiny little cysts on the ovaries. Now, something to keep in mind, even though it is called polycystic ovarian syndrome, they are actually thinking of renaming it because we are finding that it is not, we'll say, required to actually have the cysts on your ovaries to have PCOS. So if that blows your mind, I'll say it again. You do not actually have to have cysts, tiny cysts, on your ovaries to have polycystic ovarian syndrome. We need another name. We need another name for it. But what we do see and what I see in a majority of my patients, especially those with hypothyroidism, is missing periods, irregular periods, acne, hair growth. This is where the, I can never say this word properly, hertuism, hertuism, the hair growth, the androgens, the hair loss, the increase in dihydrotestosterone that when paired up with hypothyroidism, oh, isn't that so much fun? Not only do we see a receding hairline, but now we're losing hair from our heads. Our hair is thinning, and falling out, and oh, by the way, it's like straw too. Another double whammy. So we have a double whammy to our metabolism, double whammy to our hair, double whammy to fertility. So we have hypothyroidism already affecting our sex hormones. Now add on PCOS on top of that. Hypothyroidism is already making our periods irregular. Now we have PCOS that are making our periods irregular. Now we have increased insulin oh, wait, we can have increased insulin and insulin resistance from hypothyroidism. We also see it with PCOS. 
Now you're really screwed when it comes to weight loss and getting pregnant because both of those things are working against you. So to diagnose, let me bring it back around, to diagnose PCOS, increase androgens, increase insulin, irregular periods, missing periods, and or cysts on the ovaries. With hypothyroidism, the reason why it drives PCOS is hypothyroidism will actually trigger the ovaries to become cystic. Now, we just said that it's not required to have cysts on the ovaries, but hypothyroidism in and of itself will trigger the ovaries to become cystic. So what we'll see is an increase in TRH, which will then increase prolactin and increase TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. With that increase in prolactin, we see an increase in ovarian cysts. With the increase in TSH, you move into a hypothyroid state. Researchers are still determining which came first, the chicken or the egg. And some studies will even say, you know, eh, there's not really a strong correlation there. But I will tell you in my practice, if someone comes to me and they have diagnosed hypothyroidism or I find that they have subclinical hypothyroidism, I will look for PCOS. I will test every hormone. I will test your insulin. I am looking for insulin resistance because the two coincide 90% of the time in female patients, 90% of the time. So again, we have the increased TRH, thyroid releasing hormone. We have increased prolactin. We have increased TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Then that increased prolactin actually inhibits ovulation. With that, and then with the increased TSH, that's going to affect follicle stimulating hormone. So now we have, let's try to simplify it, right? Now we have increased TSH. So you're becoming, remember with TSH, and I know I'm talking to a lot of veterans, you already know what I'm talking about. But for those of you who are new, just jumping on, TSH is one of the only lab markers that you will see where high means low. So the higher TSH goes, the more hypo, the lower functioning your thyroid becomes. So high TSH, low thyroid function. As TSH rises, you become more hypothyroid. Now what we're seeing is an, an effect on the follicle stimulating hormone. We're seeing an increase in prolactin levels, and this is completely inhibiting ovulation. No fertility, none. And that's how not only does hypothyroidism, if that comes first, affect fertility, but we're also seeing it in the reverse where the cysts on the ovaries will affect the prolactin levels and increase the TSH. So it's kind of like a back and forth. PCOS also increases your risk of goiter. Now, the statistics that we're seeing is only about like 17 and 27 percent. But you have to remember when you're reading these studies, they're really um, they're kind of going through and how do I want to say this? They're not looking at the full population, right? They do their best. I like randomized control trials. Um, I'm a huge fan of case series where we look back. So if I were to do a case series on my patients, that, like I said, about 90% of them have PCOS and hypothyroidism together, I think we would see a larger percentage than 17 and 27, 25%. Uh, but with PCOS, I do see an increase in goiter in my own practice. And this was backed by a study as well. When we're looking at the symptoms alone, right, just the symptomatology of both conditions, we see an increased BMI, body mass index, not really my favorite for determining weight, right? I, you can have somebody who's muscular and have a BMI and they're technically obese, but they're not. But let's just generalize it. An increase in weight, an increase in BMI, an increase in body fat, okay? Not muscle, don't go bad BMI then. Let's say an increase in body fat. And then we have that and insulin resistance pairing up hand in hand right? So you see a lot of insulin resistance with higher body mass indexes, higher body fat percentages. With that high insulin, that insulin resistance, meaning you have excess insulin in the body, you are at a greater risk of gaining weight. You're also producing pro-inflammatory cytokines, pro-inflammatory markers. 
So you have high insulin resistance, high inflammation, increased risk of obesity. Now we're talking about both conditions here, hypo and picos. Then you actually, with all those three things going on, that insulin resistance, the increased pro-inflammatory markers, and obesity, you have, here's my hypo patients, a decrease in DIO2 activity at the level of the pituitary, resulting in T3 deficiency and an increase in TSH. Now we can loop that, that back around to what we said earlier, but let me repeat that because it's important. With PCOS, we see increased goiter. Okay, so PCOS and hypothyroidism. And listen, let me say this. If you are diagnosed with a goiter or you have, this is kind of my side note, soapbox. If you're my patient, you've heard me say this. If you have a goiter and you are told, oh, don't worry about it, we're just going to keep an eye on that. What organ or gland I mean, if my dog has a growth under his skin, I'm taking him to the vet and I'm getting it checked out and I will not accept, and eh, we're just going to keep an eye on it and cross our fingers for an answer. If you are diagnosed with a goiter and you have symptoms, it is something to pay attention to. It is something to get proper diagnosis and proper treatment for. That's my side soapbox. I had to mention that since we're talking about goiter because it pisses me off when patients come in and they've been told by a doctor, oh yeah, you have um, multi-nodules, goiters, cysts on your thyroid, but not a problem. We're just going to keep an eye on those. Meanwhile, they're gaining weight, they're losing hair, they can't make it through their day. If you have a goiter, you need to get treatment. So just text me, give me a call. We'll straighten you out. Back to my point. PCOS, increased goiter. Now you have increased insulin resistance, probably an increase in weight, a little bit of obesity, a little bit of increased fat. You have pro-inflammatory markers. Whenever we're carrying around excess body fat, whenever we have insulin resistance, we have increased pro-inflammatory markers. We have an increase in systemic inflammation. Our whole body becomes inflamed. Now with that, we have a decrease in DIO2 activity at the pituitary level resulting in decreased T3, T3 deficiency, and an increase in TSH. Remember we just said high TSH, low thyroid function. You have a T3 deficiency, you have a problem. You are hypothyroid and you're suffering at the same time. So we have that increased TSH, decreased T3, we're looping it back around to what we talked about before, that increased TSH increases prolactin back and forth, and the ovaries become cystic. You have hypothyroidism and PCOS at the same time. That was kind of scientific -y, I know. Hopefully, you followed. So now we can get into the, the symptoms and the treatment of it as well. Symptoms very much coincide with hypothyroid symptoms. The main symptoms in PCOS surround weight gain, inability to lose weight, and think of all the androgenic side effects of PCO. So we're thinking acne, dark facial hair, loss of hair, receding hairline, loss of hair. Sometimes we'll have some alopecia on the back of the head. And then we also have the infertility, the irregular periods, the missed periods. We'll have low progesterone levels. So even in females in their 20s and 30s, I can see progesterone levels of that of a postmenopausal woman. So we'll have low progesterone. Estrogen can be either high or low. So someone with PCOS can go into an estrogen dominant state, which produces a slew of symptoms on, their, on its own or an estrogen deficient state, and that estrogen can ebb and flow as well, depending on the treatment as well. And then we have high testosterone, usually high free testosterone and high DHT, that hydrotestosterone. So that's what we'll see with PCOS. Now think about hypothyroidism and all the symptoms that go along with that. Weight gain, irregular periods, hair loss, um, with PCOS, we can get a little bit of anemia 
And we definitely see that in hypothyroidism. We see a lot of low ferritin levels, dysregulated iron. That's going to interfere with T4 to T3 conversion. So we're seeing a lot of the shared symptoms. Leptin, we don't often talk about. It kind of, leptin is like, you know, the forgotten stepchild. We need to talk about it a little bit more. But leptin is your satiety hormone. So ghrelin is your hunger hormone. Leptin is your satiety hormone. We're always talking about insulin resistance, but leptin resistance comes into play as well with both hypothyroidism and PCOS. So what if you have both, right? What if you're like me, you have both hypo and PCOS. Now you already have insulin resistance. Now you have leptin resistance on top of that. You're going to be hungry all the time. That's going to get in the way of weight loss. That could be a trifecta whammy. I say a double whammy. If you have leptin resistance and insulin resistance and hypothyroidism, you are at like a trifecta whammy of losing weight. And I would like to say you might as well hang it up, but that's not true because we can fix it. We can fix it all. All of that is fixable. Now, we've talked before in other lives and in my um, other videos that I've posted about treatment of hypothyroidism. We're not going down that rabbit hole today. We could talk about hypothyroidism treatments. We could talk about that next week. But today, I want to focus on the treatments of PCOS. So like I said earlier, the first treatment, let's throw you on some birth control. What's the problem there? First of all, we are putting synthetic hormones into your body. Many, many women don't do well on synthetic hormones. Some women will tolerate them in the beginning and then start to develop the side effects, water retention, weight gain, irritability, mood swings. And some people know, some women know right off the bat, nope, I cannot tolerate the synthetic hormones going into my body. It's just not happening. And I was one of those kind of right in between. When I was younger and I was first diagnosed with PCOS, by the way, I was diagnosed hypo first, then PCOS. And again, this comes back to my functional medicine doctor who is my mentor that started me on this path to helping you and helping other people. He was so brilliant. So he diagnosed me with hypo. Well, you know, you all know I was misdiagnosed six times. The seventh one actually diagnosed me. My functional medicine doctor fixed me. So I was all good. I want to say for like a year or so. And I had gotten used to missed periods. That didn't bother me. Now that I'm 46, I'm super pumped that I have a regular cycle every single month. Every time it comes, I'm like, yes, another month not in menopause. But back then, you know, my 20s, I mean, come on, you know, you miss a cycle, you're thrilled because, well, unless you think you're pregnant. But most of the time, you're like, yay, I get to skip it this month. I hope no guys are watching. You can just click off if you are. But so... I was used to that, but then I started breaking out. I never got the hair growth. I never got the, the, the dark hairs, but I started breaking out like crazy. I looked like I was 14 again. It was insane. And I was starting to put on a little bit of weight. So here I'm thinking, oh, it's my thyroid. I need a change of medication. We need to do something. You know, I walked into that man's office. He looked at me. He goes, you have PCOS. I mean, we can test for it and do a vaginal ultrasound if you want, but I'm telling you right now, you have PCOS. Did not put me on birth control. I did go on metformin. Now, some of you are like, eh, metformin, it's horrible. You know, I use metformin in patients that can tolerate it. Um, here's the thing with metformin. And since then, I've switched to berberine. We'll talk about that in a second. Here's the thing with metformin. And he told me this all these many years ago. And remember, he was a pharmacist as well. So he was a functional medicine practitioner and a pharmacist. So he knew pharmacology. And he said, you know, of all the medications out there, metformin is not that bad. Now, we didn't know back then the, the kind of tie-in connection that we have right now to Alzheimer's. So there's a little bit of a higher risk when you're on metformin to having Alzheimer's. And with it in my family, yes, I am going to be genetically tested. I do want to know if I have the APO, APOE4 gene. Um, however, at the time, we didn't know the connection. So he was pretty much like, you know, take the metformin. We used Vitex Chase Berry, Agnes Castus, Vitex Chase Berry to bring up my progesterone naturally. We used DIM and Indo3 Carbonol because I was estrogen dominant. So that brought down my estrogen. And remember, progesterone is the balancing hormone. 
So we use these things to just try to bring everything in balance. I never went on Spiro. Um, Spiro is another medication that they can use for, it's a diuretic, but it's used to reduce androgen levels. So my, my testosterone, my androgen wasn't that high. It was more at the, the insulin resistant. It was more the insulin resistant side of things that was causing my PCOS symptoms. And now with insulin resistance, there is a tie to higher androgen. So by using metformin over time, my periods balanced out, they became regular and the acne went away. I attribute that to the Vitex as well, because when I balanced the progesterone and when I would go off of the Vitex, I would break out again. So that really helped. And now I use Designs for Health Progestive Ale with a lot of my patients. And then I use their FemGuard Plus Balance because that has the Vitex and the DIM and the Indole 3 Carbonyl in it. So I'll use kind of a combination of that with my patients now to reduce acne, reduce those androgens. And then in terms of the insulin resistance, I did eventually switch over to using berberine. You've heard me talk about berberine. It is absolutely wonderful. There's all kinds of medical literature on how well it works. It works as well as metformin to reduce insulin resistance, to reduce glucose. And I I made the switch from metformin to berberine like that. Did not gain weight. And believe me, I tested it on myself years ago before I tried it on any of my patients. And I thought, well, if I'm going to try this out, I will know for sure. Because if I start gaining weight, it's because I need the metformin and not the berberine. I did the transition. It was beautiful. Now I'm on the berberine and I'm fine. Um, but I will still use metformin in some patients that absolutely need it. And berberine and metformin work beautifully together. It's a nice little one-two punch, especially for those with very high insulin levels who are very insulin resistant, really kind of walking that fine lines, kind of tipping their toe into the type 2 diabetes water there. So high um, fasting insulin, high fasting glucose, high A1Cs, we might use the combination of. And quite honestly, that works, that natural combination for PCOS, the progestive ale, sometimes the DIM and indole 3 carbonyl with the FemGuard Plus Balance, and then the berberine and or the metformin is enough to reduce the symptoms, bring down the insulin, help with fertility, balance out hormones. Now, while doing all of this, believe me, I didn't forget about the thyroid. So let's say a patient comes to me and I've had this. They initially come to me and they say, well, I have PCOS and I can't take birth control or I can't get pregnant and I'm going to the fertility specialist. I will look at the thyroid as well. And I would say about eh, probably about eight times out of 10, there is a subclinical, if not full blown, hypothyroid problem. And sometimes there's Hashimoto's present there too. So we have to treat both. We can't just treat the PCOS and not treat the master gland above it that is controlling everything below it. So we have to treat both at the same time. And I'll tell you, when you do that, things just come into beautiful alignment. Hair starts growing back. The bald spots where people start getting the receding hairline starts coming back, start seeing those little baby hairs, you start to lose weight, periods will start to become more regular. You might be a little bit sporadic at first, maybe instead of one every six months, you're getting one every three months, and then one every two months, and then it becomes one every 35 to 40 days, and then you'll get into that nice 28 to 30 day range, and it just balances out. Um, so that is my treatment protocol for PCOS. My beef with treatment of PCOS by conventional medicine is throwing a woman on birth control and, and, or spiral, spiral, spirulonolactone, say that too. I have two words that I can't say. Three, the diidonase, diidodinase, the spirulonolactone, and the other one that I said earlier today. Right. So those are my three downfalls. Don't make me say those words. Um, but yeah, that's my beef with PCOS. I want to hear from you. I want to know if you're like me. And I'll tell you, I mean, like I said, I have the reason I have such great success with my patients 
is because you treat the whole person. I have to treat the whole person. I was treated as a whole person. By the way, I did have the ultrasound and I do have Picos. It was confirmed, but my FMP was brilliant and he looked at me and he knew exactly what was going on. So since then, listen, my skin's been fine. I don't have cystic acne anymore. I might get a little pimple here and there. My thyroid is optimized, all balanced out. I posted my, I know this is kind of a side note too. Some of you saw my post from last week, like at end of the week, I think I put it up on Friday. So I had to have my TSH and my free T4 done for not checking my thyroid. Well, it wasn't a routine thyroid screen kind of a thing. Believe me, I would have had all the tests done if it was. This was for a procedure and they wanted to test my TSH and free T4. I was like, whatever. I told them, I'm like, it's going to come back suppressed because I'm on T3. The guy's like, the PA is like, yeah, I'll mark that down. Not a problem. Okay, don't worry about it. So it comes back and it is suppressed. It's probably the lowest it has been pretty much ever. But um, I did post that. I consulted with Rory Marshall because you know when it's yourself, you start to second guess. Not that I thought that I was hyper because I know that I'm not hyper. But when you see numbers like that, you go, huh, is that normal? Because when it's yourself, you just, you, you second guess. I mean, believe me, I've done this before with my mentor too. A few years ago, my blood urea, nitrogen, and creatinine came back all wonky. I texted him, sent him my numbers. He's like, yeah, you're just dehydrated. So you start second guessing yourself. So I consulted with Rory. He confirmed what I was thinking anyways. And I wanted to post it for you guys because so many of you look at or have been diagnosed or treated with medication or had your medication pulled because you were told that you were hyper when you really weren't hyper. Um, so my point is my thyroid is optimized. That's optimal for me. And you have to find, we, we in functional medicine will give you optimal standards, but then you have to find what is your optimal as well. So that's what I help patients do. So that's my story of PCOS, my story of patients with PCOS. I know so many of you out there have it. You have it in conjunction with hypothyroidism. And I felt like this was a pertinent topic to talk about today. Anyways, thank you guys so much for all you do. And let me know if you have any questions and I will see you back here next week. Okay, I will talk to you all soon. Have a great week. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoyed this episode. As always, please share this episode and check out the entire Thyroid Fixer podcast on all podcast platforms. If you're on iTunes, it would be awesome if you left me a review. And just a reminder, anything you hear on this podcast is not intended to diagnose or treat. So you always want to check with your doctor about any advice given on this podcast. And if you'd like to schedule a discovery call, please refer to the show notes for all the links. Everything that we talked about in the podcast will be in there with a guide for you on how you can get your life back. Let's get you fixed.